I call this meeting to order. This is the work session of the Mayor and Council of the City of Bisbee County of Cochise and State of Arizona to be held on Tuesday, January 14, 2020, at 5.30 p.m. at the City Hall Building, 915 South Toberville Road, Bisbee, Arizona. Ms. Coronado, would you please call the roll? Mayor Pro Tem Lewis Pollock. Here. Councilmember Joni Giacomino. Here. Councilmember Bill Higgins. Here. Mayor David M. Smith. Here. Councilmember Leslie Johns is excused. Councilmember Joan Hansen. Here. Councilmember Anna Klein. Here. City Staff Teresa Coleman, City Manager. Ashley Coronado, City Clerk. Albert E. Chave, Police Chief. James Led Ledbetter, City Attorney. Thank you, ma'am. Welcome, everybody. Um, although it is not on the agenda, I will allow a call to the public. I don't see any call to the public. I have a sign in sheet. For item number one, um, Ms. Coleman, do you want to set item one on the table and then I'll call everybody up? Uh, may I defer to the attorney? Surely. Okay. Thank you. Members of the public, Mayor, Council. Um, staff and I have prepared for you um, an animal ordinance that is uh, before you tonight. Um, it has garnered a lot of, obviously, feedback from the community. Some of that feedback from the community has been interesting because a lot of the community complaints have been addressing things that are currently in your ordinance. For example, defanging of dogs. That's in your current ordinance. It has been removed at your direction from this draft ordinance. So there are many things that when folks finally sat down and read the ordinance that's been in place for some 90 years, that folks got some concern about it reading what was there. The direction that I received from your new city manager, however, was to incorporate it and, and research, involve ourselves with consultants, with some veterinarians, follow the direction of the American Humane Society, the American Bird Conservancy, and the um, HSUS, which is the Humane Society of the United States. I didn't know there were two until embarking on this task. So in going through, a number of things have been added to your ordinance. You have before you copies that show the current ordinance and the yellow language, which is new language. So, for example, in the proposed ordinance that's before you, there is now penalties for abandoning an animal. That didn't previously exist under your old ordinance. Abuse is now defined under your new ordinance. There was vagueness as to what constituted animal abuse in the past. There's a pr provisions now about animal control officers because there wasn't an animal control officer when your old ordinance was passed. There are new provisions associated with things like baiting, uh, which means to attack with violence, to provoke or harass any animal. Those have been added at staff direction into the ordinance. Um, you may have heard in the community there's a new provision that has concern about raising bees. That would be misstated. What's in the ordinance with respect to bees is anybody who raises bees in your community, consistently with the recommendation from the University of Arizona, must report that they're raising bees. Uh, most bees in this area have now become Africanized, and the city manager then issues a permit for a two-year period to hold bees, as an example. The city manager also, with respect to existing livestock, um, she has altered the provisions, allowing existing livestock to, leave, to live in the city of Bisbee until that livestock is deceased. But new livestock, which would include mules, horses, um, cows, for example, those would have to have specific permission and be licensed by the city appropriately. Um, another issue that has been, I think, has garnered some significant questioning um, was the issue with respect to feral cat communities. Consistently, again, with the American Humane Society, the uh, American Bird Conservancy, Humane Society of the United States, uh, staff and I have recommended to you that you go away from the feral um, cat community which requires capturing, spaying, notching the animal's ears, all of that under existing ordinances, and instead go to the provision that prohibits the feeding of feral cats, and also the feeding of feral animals for the protection of other animals, and for the protection and the safety of the cats themselves. Again, this is not, not something that is uh, arcane, perhaps, or this is not something that the um, staff are coming to you to try to provoke, but rather the staff's goal was to take an ordinance that's been around for many years that had some serious provisions in it that when I think when people read them they were concerned as was the staff. So according to the staff um, directed a more humane approach um, and sought to do that. Will there be exceptions of course? Will the council, what we do is 
give suggestions and ideas to the council. You are the policy makers. Um, we do not advance an agenda to you. Rather, we give you ideas that are consistently with what research suggests um, our current direction from folks who study this issue regularly and frankly for the benefit of animals. And these provisions also, for example, allow now for any city employee to, if they see an animal in danger, to act. Previously, there had to be a call to law enforcement if an animal was left in a hot car with the windows up. Now, others can act to seek the protection of the animal. So, I think staff did a real good job, and frankly, there's been consider probably more than any other issue we've worked on, there's been a lot of feedback from staff with additional ideas to make Visby's current ordinance more humane. And again, if you have any specific questions, I'm glad to answer them, but that's kind of the background on what was bringing us to today and bringing this issue before me. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Mr. Blackburn. Uh, folks, there's seats up here. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll be going through this list. Um, I will be, uh, obviously, we have a three minute rule as per the city code, as well as uh, for it not to become cum cumulative, for everybody not to get up and say the same thing. Um, numbers don't necessarily mean uh, that your argument having to do with anything is correct. Rady and Porter, ma'am. Ann Porter. I currently live at 303 Mill, but historically I lived in Old Bisbee at 416B Curley on the edge of the feral cat problem. I was born and raised in Bisbee and am quite well aware of some of these ordinances and how they have evolved organically through time. It is my opinion that the while some of these aspects of this ordinance are certainly more humane in terms of how animals are treated, it appears to me to be much more restrictive. It is typical in this community in the last few years that we're really busy killing the goose that laid the golden egg. The more regulations that we can apply, the less Bisbee is the unique and pleasant place that it was to live in. And we need to really consider whether or not it's the city's job to police the number of chickens that someone has or, um, uh, you know, down to the minutia that exists in this ordinance. The city has paid lip service to desiring a sustainable community, but if I am if the number, let's say that I am, I'm raising chickens, which I do, and I have six chickens, but I don't, six chickens are not gonna give me enough eggs to supply to someone to the farmer's market, for instance. If you want that sustainable kind of thing in this community, you need to develop ordinances that support that to some degree. It makes better sense in your ordinance to look at language that is, um, rather than saying, I can have six chickens, it is, I can have chickens if I care for them in a manner that is equitable with the standards of good animal husbandry. I, you know, if I only have 100 square feet, I can't have 100 chickens because that's inappropriate way to keep an animal. It is not humane. The city needs to have a more flexible approach when they are looking at things that are restricting what is the nature of our community. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Catherine Wells. Get under what Rady Ann said. Yeah, very well spoken. Well, thank you. Dana House. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, my name is Dana 
house. I live at 64 Cochise Row, and I'm here to just speak specifically on TNR and the feral cat issues. Um, since I purchased my house five years ago, I've been doing trap and release on the row. I noticed there were a lot of ill cats when I bought my house. And I have successfully trapped and altered and released, to my knowledge, all of them on my street and run a successful cat colony. I have a feral cat house that is shelter for them. And between my five neighbor houses and I, they all are fed and taken care of. And I just want to state that as a testament to TNR being successful. Two years ago, we had upwards of 43 ill, malnourished, uh, malign kittens literally dying in the street in front of my house. And last year, we had one kitten that was taken to the shelter, altered and adopted out. And I haven't seen any kittens since. So it's just highly successful. And with the topic of TNR or feral cats in general, it is not a reality that it's something you can get away from. It has to be addressed, and if it is ignored, it spirals out of hand, which we've seen on Brophy. And more recently, I've been asked to help with TNR in other locations in Bisbee, which I have assisted with. Um, also to success, it requires somebody who is willing to put in the time, but I take the cats out of Cochise County. I take them up to Pima County to the Humane Society in Tucson where they treat them and I bring them back and release them because everything in Cochise County is so strapped and it's so difficult. The shelter is overburdened, but I'm willing to do that and I know other people are as well and it's worked very successfully and it's nice to see those cats being healthy and vaccinated, not spreading diseases like they have been and are up on Brophy. Um, and that's, I just want to say that it works. Thank you, ma'am. Right. Jeff Harris. There's so much I dislike about, my name is Jeff Harris. I live in one. I've lived there for almost four decades. There's so much I dislike about this ordinance, it's hard to know where to start. Um, what I might read is uh, case law from this state. Municipalities derive their powers from charters or, or the legislature. The powers of the municipal corporation are those given it by the state. The, many of the aspects of this proposed animal ordinance exceed the limit the city has to regulate. Many of the aspects are unconstitutional. This ordinance is at best a bad idea. The answer to problems is not to pass more and more restrictive legislation. It's just wrong headed. It's against the very nature of this community, this small rural community. This is not a gated community that needs oppressive legislation to keep the folks in line. One of the, uh, one of the things that was mentioned was that the grandfathering was going to run with the animal, not with the land use. This is not appropriate. Grandfathering, by its very nature, runs with the land, not with each individual animal. Even if it were, this is an absurd concept. What are we going to have? Hire some more people to keep check of each animal, see when one dies or when doesn't. This is absurd on its face. For this oppressive legislation to be enforced as it is written in the draft, you would need to hire many more animal control officers or police. It is, it is unbearably, intolerably intrusive. Um, one of the things that bothers me is that um, it 
under the guise of barring interference with an uh, animal control officer, it is making and criminalizing the desire or the possibility of, of resisting unconstitutional warrantless searches of one's premises. This is crazy. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Your time is up. I appreciate your uh, Good evening, Mayor, Council, and staff of the City of Bisbee. My name is Karen Schumacher. I live and work in Old Bisbee. I'm here tonight to speak against the proposed animal ordinance. Honestly, more than anything, I'm annoyed that I have to be here this evening and say the following things that seem so blatantly obvious to myself and so many other members of my community. My first point is that the, most of the unnecessary drama that ensued, thanks to this animal ordinance, could have almost entirely been circumvented had a work session occurred before the vote in December. In this case, I will forgive the city manager under the assumption that she did not perhaps realize the intensity of backlash that her agenda item would create. Those I do not forgive are those of you who advise, speak to, and work with the city manager every day that did not try and dissuade this irrational turn of events. Writing an ordinance of this kind without fully researching the recommendations of national organizations such as the Humane Society of Arizona, or asking for input from the Bisbee Animal Shelter staff and volunteers, those members of your community that work every day on the ground dealing with these ex exact issues, is at best an act of complete reckless and oblivious arrogance, and, it's at, best, and at worst, no, it, sorry, <clears throat> It is, at worst, a complete reckless and oblivious arrogance, and at best, an insult to those who have more knowledge and yet less civic power than yourselves. In short, so little thought was given to practical procedure and community input that I doubt there is any virility behind the actual ordinance should it pass. Speaking of, my second point is this. As this ordinance is currently written, there are more holes in it than there are tunnels under the city of Bisbee. <laughs> my background is not in government, but I have read my fair share of ordinances, and it took me several rereadings to even understand what the city was proposing, especially when it came to livestock. And I still am at a complete loss on how the city intends to enforce any of it. We all know there is little enforcement of many current ordinances, and so this ordinance is probably nothing more than a copy and pasted waste of time and paper. That is, if cherry-picked to be enforced, sets the city up for additional unnecessary lawsuits, public confusion, unclear repercussions, and a ridiculous amount of work hours spent by city employees. And third, someone chose to include at the end of your agenda packet tonight an outdated article from 2004 that speaks against the feeding of feral cats. What was not shared with the public and was not included in your packet is what I find more troublesome. On December 11th, the senior analysis or analyst for cat protection and policy for the Humane Society of America and the senior state director of the Humane Society of Arizona wrote a letter to the mayor that says, and I quote, banning the feeding of community cats does not make them go away. He goes up, on to talk about a feeding ban that is ineffective and in inhumane policy your, your time is better of Thank you. Thank you. statutes that address various animal welfare issues. Most recently, an anti-cruelty law was enacted. It even addresses animal hoarding, which is frequently labeled as a feral cat problem. I'm concerned about why some of these state laws are included in this ordinance, which is supposed to be local laws, and why they're not identified as such. It makes it very hard to read the document. 
Also, it would help to know what are changes to the existing ordinance and what are, are the original ordinance. I've never in my life been in a council meeting where you don't strike through things so that you can see what the changes are. Um, the other thing is why fix things that aren't broken? I mean, I'm especially caught up in the feral cat issue, but has there been a problem with bees and mules? I mean, this is a great way to reduce our census because people live here for certain reasons, and that's one of them, like Brady Ann said. Um, what I find most confusing is how frequently Bisbee writes ordinances and how rarely they enforce them. If we can enforce a leash law, if we can't enforce a leash law, how are we gonna enforce this 12-page document? We have a 20-hour-per-week animal control officer. When someone calls about a dog at large, if she's not on duty, the police say, oh, she'll be back tomorrow at nine. So yeah, we're gonna be able to do all of this. That makes a lot of sense. Let's support, let's appoint an ad hoc committee that understands our community and animal issues and is up to date on current animal welfare standards. This obviously wasn't the case. Emily Kayer, Ward 1. I live and work in Old Bisbee. I'm here to read part of a letter that was addressed to Mayor Smith and uh, the mayor and all the council members received regarding the fear of cat issue. Uh, cat management should be designed to protect public safety, protect cats, and provide animal control agencies with effective, proactive, humane tools to manage cat populations. Unfortunately, the language of this proposed uh, ordinance that we're all here about tonight fails to include any provisions to that end and instead relies on an inhumane ban of feeding feral cats. Banning the feeding of community cats does not make them go away. There are more effective strategies to managing free-roaming cat populations than employing such inhumane measures. Reactive, punitive strategies such as feeding bans have proven ineffective at managing community cats time and time again. Communities across the country have found citations do not stop people from feeding cats. When feeding is sanctioned, it can be monitored and managed. This means it can be done in a way that is sanitary and will not attract wildlife or otherwise cause a public nuisance. A ban often does not result in cats not being fed, but rather can create new conflicts. This is a quote from the American Bar Association that was in that letter. Quote, feeding bans cause a real dilemma legally for caregivers. By feeding the community cats they care for, caregivers could be violating such an ordinance. But by adhering to the ordinance, they could conceivably find themselves in violation of a cruelty provision by failing to provide care to those same animals. End quote. Indeed, the very ordinance which bans the feeding of feral cats also requires caretakers to provide adequate food and water to those same animals. The Humane Society of the United States uh, goes on to say, we encourage you to adopt TNR, that's trap, neuter, return, as an official policy, including the associated caretaking of these cats and the humane mitigation of complaints. When implemented effectively, a community cat program can, one, decrease municipal costs. TNR is less expensive than trapping and impounding cats, caring for them during their stray hold, and providing an outcome, be that adoption, transfer, or euthanasia. Restricting feeding is difficult and costly to enforce and does not address the root cause of the problem and is simply a waste of taxpayer dollars. Two, it can decrease public health and safety concerns. Vaccinating community cats against rabies as part of a TNR program should be supported as a preventive measure against the potential spread of the disease. A feeding ban simply results in unvaccinated, unhealthy cats continuing to live in the community. Third, it can decrease nuisance complaints. Spayed and neuter cats are less likely to fight over mates, food, and territory, they roam less and they no longer emit the pungent odor of intact male cat urine. Managed colonies of cats are less likely to disturb trash cans looking for food, and through the humane, use of humane deterrence, be conditioned to avoid areas where they are not welcome. Finally, this community cat program, when implemented effectively, can reduce predation on wildlife. Limiting the feeding of these cats may put native wildlife in danger. To wrap up, when the community is engaged in the solution, working in collaboration with the government, results will be seen more quickly. Regular feeding of cats at established locations allows Thank caretakers you. to identify new cats I'm sorry who may be lost or in need of sterilization or rehoming. This is the most effective method Man, to reduce cat populations up. and the issues related to them. Thank you. Uh, 
I'm Kelly Gallagher, and I'm at the 510 A Rugby, and I'm president of Friends of the Animal Shelter. Um, there's really only one reason in doing research why communities enact feeding bans, and it's because they're exasperated and they want an immediate fix. Well, a feeding ban is not an immediate fix. Um, it's not a fix at all. I think the people who are advocates of this ban need to explain how and why they expect this to be an effective solution. Like step one, there's a ban. Step two, everyone complies. Step three, what, we have like starving zombie cats roaming around? Is that, I'd like a step-by-step -step analysis of how this is expected to work. And most important, I'd like for someone to cite a single place where a feeding ban has resulted in successfully reducing the number of feral cats. Because from all the research that I've done, I can't find such a place. Um, so I don't know why people think that the same tired solution would look in a different outcome here. Not to mention the incredible inhumanity of this ordinance. And um, simply put, I think we're better than this. So when you're ready to discuss actual effective solutions for community cats that the whole community can participate in and get behind, Friends of the Animal Shelter is ready to sit down with you. And so is the Humane Society of the United States, whose attention this issue has been brought. And it's kind of a big deal that the state's director is getting involved in this, and we should take her up on her offer of help. Thank you. Claire Schaefer. and all of our Bisbee family who's shown up today. Can everybody hear me? Yes. Okay, because usually I talk too, too softly. Um, what I'd like to say tonight is um, I've done some research and some of it's already been covered so I won't discuss it. I won't bore everybody with what I have to say. Um, I'd like to um, give the, dis the definition of wildlife per the uh, state statutes, everybody knows I like the statutes. Um, in Title 17, Statute 17-101, quote, wildlife means all wild animals, wild birds, and the nest and eggs thereof, reptiles, amphibians, mollusks, crustaceans, and fish, including <coughs> eggs or spawn. Now, what's in the actual draft where it came from, I don't know, but there's an add-on that says also includes domesticated animals who are not under the care of a person or persons and or which need veterinary care. I don't know where it came from. It would be nice to find out. It also says in the statutes, wild means in reference to mammals and birds those species found in a state of nature, okay? I don't understand where some of the stuff is that's showing up, you know, in the draft. It'd be nice if we knew that, um, because not all of it is, I don't know where the legalities are, um, so maybe we need to be uh, addressing some of that. Also, just so everybody knows, okay? Some of these uh, offenses, uh, to me, are kind of uh, obscene. I mean, and that's in the, the uh, statutes for misdemeanor sentencing, uh, ARS 13707. A petty offense, which you'll see a lot on there. It's no jail time, it's a type of misdemeanor, and you get up to a $300 fine. So if you feed something you're not supposed to, Okay, you can get up to a $300 fine. You get a class two <coughs> misdemeanor, you have a maximum of four months in jail, $700 fine up to and a surcharge, and two years probation. A class three misdemeanor is there a little bit, and that's a possible pen penalty of up to one year of um, unsupervised probation, up to $500 fine plus surcharge, and up to 30 days jail, and that'll stay on your record for 99 years. Mm -hmm. You can try to get it expunged, <clears throat> near to nothing of a chance. 
So you can have that on your record forever. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you very much. doing tonight. <clears throat> you can tell that this is a pretty serious concern for uh, a lot of the citizens of Bisbee here, just by just showing up here. And I know hundreds of other people that would like to be here right now to be able to express um, their dissatisfaction with this ordinance that you're trying to push through right here. It doesn't make any sense to me whatsoever. I uh, moved to town from a ranch that I was on the outskirts of town. And before I moved in, I came to the city hall and I asked them if I could bring some animals in. And um, they came out with the city um, inspector to look at the, my plot map. And they said, hey, according to how much land you have, you could have up to three horses. And I was like, oh, that's amazing. And they said, well, you could have up to three of anything that you want. And so I do have some animals um, in Old Bisbee. And they're precious. They're my pets. They're my love. And uh, I'm really surprised that you guys are trying to wrench out some people that have been raising um, their pets um, here in town. Um, so I'm totally against this ordinance and I'm really surprised that it's being pushed forward. Um, the first line that you have on this ordinance is that the purpose of this ordinance is protect the public health, the safety, and the comfort and the convenience and the general welfare in order to secure the social, physical, and economic advantages of the city and the citizens of Bisbee. That means this entire ordinance goes against that one first line that you have written on here. And the way that I see it is that there's going to be a lot of lawsuits and this is going to be a lot of time um, that you're all going to have to spend dealing with this um, as we move on. And so I appreciate all the animals here, uh, animal lovers here, <laughs> like that. Um, because um, they are our loved ones unconditionally. They give us the support. They give us comfort. They give us security. Our pets do. And so it's really sad that you can come in at this point and say, hey, sorry, yeah, you're grandfathered out. And so I just see a lawsuit coming. Thank you. to most standard readers and to not have it given to us ahead of time to even look at and see if we wanted it voted on by the, uh, the council is a little a little strange and so just to you know, look out at the crowd we've got a lot of people here that are concerned about this being passed and just to take a second look to really dive in and make sure that all the details are correct and acceptable for our town would be a nice thing thank you concerns about what's being put into our food, it's really wonderful to be able to know where your food's coming from and to be able to have that food. Um, food has to travel a long way to get to Bisbee. We're in a rural area. And I would just like you to understand that most of the people that have poultry and livestock in town, it's not because they're hoarding animals, it's actually because they, they want and need food and they give that food, what they don't use, to people like me. I just thank you so much for thinking about this part of it, okay? Thank you. Thank you.
Gretchen, there. She make an impact. Paula, Tyler. Couldn't make it in time, but she's against it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that pretty much exhausts that. A um, couple things I just wanted to say. People have, have, have come up and talked about several different uh, areas of this ordinance in total, indicating that they're against the ordinance. Um, I'm, I'm somewhat confused with, I believe that they're against certain parts of the ordinance. Uh, some may be against the whole ordinance because some are against any ordinance. Uh, but there's many, many parts of this ordinance having to do with um, outlawing uh, uh, dog fighting, uh, many other things that I feel I doubt that people are against. Um, I also just wanted to indicate that several of the people that have come up here talking about the feral cats and feeding feral cats are some of the very people that I've received phone calls from complaining about neighbors feeding feral cats. So when we look at some of these um, uh, things as a mayor, as a council, we are listening to the community. Um, obviously, you all are definitely a part of the community, but you are not the community. You're a portion of the community. I doubt that anybody here is, uh, has, has nobody's jumped up and said, I'm for feeding fair, uh, against, uh, uh, you know, I, I think we should uh, uh, not feed feral cats. Um, the uh, sometimes that's called the silent majority, but I don't know that. Um, but what am I? What I am indicating is we we act in what we're what we're told, and. Um, that this is uh, an item that has been before us, that I've discussed personally with a number of you in this audience for some at least five years, and have not been provided good concrete answers as to how we accomplish, particularly the feral cat issue. Dana is the only, Kelly, please keep it down. Dana is the only one that I know of <laughs> that has uh, actually had uh, the issue that uh, apparently is solved. Um, and I think it's interesting because as soon as this proposal came out, which has been advertised and has been available to anybody, and most people have read it, um, that as soon as it came out, all of a sudden the calls that I was getting personally about feral cats, particularly in Old Bisbee, ceased as if they all went away. And I hope they did. But it's just a very strange circumstance that once something is drafted to take a drastic step on it, all of a sudden it seems like the problem isn't as great a problem as it was. And I hope that that's the case. I hope that problem does go away. And I'd love for it to go away without any action whatsoever from the council but I think that's naive. Um, with that, I open up Mr. Pollock. Yes, thank you. I heard a lot of things uh, tonight that gave me pause to uh, contemplate, uh, but my approach to this has been twofold. I'm unhappy with the fact that there's one sentence in here that says it's against the law to feed feral cats. I don't think that's an effective solution to this problem. The other problem that I had with the original ordinance was that there was no flexibility. It was dogmatic. It said, if you do this, you're in trouble. No exceptions. Mm -hmm. The rewrite has very many exceptions in it. It gives you the opportunity to address the city and to get an exemption from the, the clauses in here that you are concerned with. I think that's a good step in the right direction. I could nitpick this thing over words here and words there. I'm not going to do that. 
my primary objective here is to address TNR versus you can't feed the cats. I've seen a lot of literature from people in the community, I've talked to people in the community, and I've done some research on my own. I can't find anything that supports a ban on feeding feral cats. I've found a lot of literature and I've heard a lot of talk from people about the success that they've had with uh, trap, neuter, and release. And I would like to see trap, neuter, and release incorporated into this ordinance so that there would be some semblance of rationality to uh, the solution for the problem. Those are my feelings, those are my comments. I agree with most of what you said, Mr. Mayor, about the opportunity for people to read this ordinance and to know what's in it. I don't agree with all the comments that were made tonight, but I think that we can come to a, a compromise on, on what's included in this ordinance. We have a problem in Ward, in ward 3. There are some provisions in this ordinance that will help solve that problem. It's a very serious problem, and I would like to see it solved amicably without any harm to individuals. I think this ordinance would go a long way to make that happen. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Ms. Jacqueline? Um, yeah, I have a few things. So first off, I want to say that um, Ms. Johns contacted me and told me to state, because she's not here, she has uh, some where she has to be, that she is not in agreement with the feeding ban, the farm animals, or the bees. Um, and I, I don't know if she's seen the, the thing where it says permission on the bees still, um, but she didn't want me to state that. Um, I, I also have an issue with the um, banning of the feeding of feral cats from a biological standpoint, and I've stated this before, if we take away the food source from those cats, they are gonna affect our population, whether we like it or not. Um, I think the issue with the, the feral cats is not, you know, the complaints about the feral cats wasn't about feral cats that were altered and uh, trapped, neutered, and released and being fed. It was the fact that there are certain cats that were not um, trapped, neutered, and released and taken care of that were causing the problem. And people's hands were tied and that was causing the issue. So yeah, people were complaining about that, but they were complaining about the fact that we could not access those cats and take care of them like they should have been, neutered them, released them in order to uh, keep the population down. Uh, Dana made a very good point when she stated uh, the population on goat row, I might say, um, it has been taken under control. Um, I have friends that live down there. I've been on that road for many years and I've noticed a substantial decrease in the cat population. Uh, I said that kind of facetiously, but Goat Row got its name because of the livestock that used to be allowed in this town. Um, yeah, it's been on our books. It's been on our books forever, but again, it hadn't been uh, enforced and unfortunately, sometimes when we go in quickly and try to enforce things, um, it causes problems because practices have already been um, put into place. And coming in now and tightening the noose, so to speak, quickly uh, is causing problems for people that have relied on food sources and these animals. Um, uh, another issue, I guess the same issue, or confusion, I, I don't want to say an issue, I keep reading these um, 6.1, 11 talking about housing livestock and fowl and it talks about specific zoning ordinances but then when you get all the way back to 6.125 after it tells you all the things you can do and how many you can have then it tells you that you're not allowed to have anything uh, and that to me is a conflict and i'm still trying to figure that out one of the ladies brought up a fact about rabbits um, i used to re raise rabbits for 4-h when i lived in disney and i lived on the trail um, i know people that raise rabbits to eat and as one lady had said that's the only food that they have uh, are we now going to be restricting uh, rabbits um, that are kept in cages and are kept you know, up and used for food sources? Um, the goats, I don't see where pygmy goats are any different than a great name. Uh, well, actually, I can see a big difference. I can see the fertilizer from the little pygmy goats that are nice and just like little dogs and the piles of fecal matter that great names distribute. Um, so I, I, I wish, or I'd like to, I would like to see more exceptions, I guess, because there, some people have pets uh, that are not within the norms of dogs and cats. Um, when I lived out of town, I had pigs, and I had pot pigs that were like my dogs. I've known people that have had pygmy, pygmy goats that have lived in their house, and they were litter trained. So, you know, I kind of, I have some issues with that. Um, and again, one of the statements in 6.111 states specific zoning ordinances. 
associated with the property if, it, if allowed. Well, it says if it's allowed there, but then again, you jump back to 6.125, and it's telling you that uh, it's unlawful for anybody to keep or maintain in the corporate city limits any, any kind of livestock. Um, working in the city of Bisbee and, and volunteering in the city of Bisbee, I come into contact with a lot of tourists, and many of them find the quirkiness and the uniqueness of the goat lady, and when cat dog uh, rat guy was here, and the piggy goats, these are things that, that kind of give Bisbee its personality, and um, I don't want to see that taken away. Um, again, when you, and I know I'm kind of rambling, sorry, ADHD, but uh, 6.116, 6.116, again, <coughs> talks about it's unlawful for any person or entity to herd, hold, or pasture a herd. A herd is more than three. So is it saying in that statement that I can now have two? Two goats, you know, two pigs, and my, you know. So again, I'm finding a little bit of, of confusion. Um, I was originally against the, the banning of bees, and, and now with this 6.126, it reading the permission required, I can understand the necessity of that. Um, you're not being banned, you're allowed to register your bees, which is a safety issue. I can get that and I appreciate that. I also want to say that I appreciate the many things that were added in protection of animals. Uh, the baiting, the um, protection of animals in hot cars, um, those that are being tethered, chained, etc. So there are, there are good things in here that I, I appreciate, but there are still some issues that I have and would like to see maybe worked on some more. Thank you. Does the black cat need to come sit down here? Yeah. <laughs> if you need to sit down here, you may. Otherwise, you can okay. stay where you are. I just was giving you that opportunity. <laughs> stories that nobody's interested in. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you a story that you're not gonna be interested in. Uh, <coughs> I worked um, at Great, uh, for Great Lakes Steel Corporation for 30 years down river, Detroit. The steel mill took up five miles of riverfront intermittently. There was access to the river in certain places, but for the most part, it was five miles of steel mill. Now in this five miles of steel mill, uh, there were feral cats and uh, they wanted those feral cats in there to keep the rats down. Because uh, rats were a problem. You know, the cats themselves, they could deal with. And uh, I believe it was 1957 or 1959, I'm not sure, I don't remember, uh, but there was a log steel strike. It went on for months and months. And uh, there was uh, a number of, of uh, employees uh, that had to stay in the mill during that period of time to uh, maintain certain things, to keep certain things going, uh, keep an eye on the mill itself. And uh, after a short period of time, they were contacting people uh, uh, on the outside to sneak up the Detroit River, go around, go around the picket line, and bring in cat food, because those feral cats were scaring those people to death. They were afraid to leave the offices. There was uh, uh, because uh, the cats had been used to being fed by humans, no more food, and they actually uh, were terrifying the people that were in there. So you stop feeding the feral cats, they're not going away. They're gonna get terrifying, you know, and, and, and that happened, that happened, I know it did. Uh, and uh, so, you know, not to feed but the feral cats, uh, I, I hate to see a situation uh, here in Bisbee where people were afraid to walk down Broken Avenue for fear of <laughs> being attacked by feral cats. And I agree with Joni Jagermino that there's a lot of good things in this ordinance. People come standing saying that they're against the ordinance, and I know what you really mean is that you're against certain parts of the ordinance. You're not against the whole ordinance. You guys don't want to have dog fighting. I mean, just fans. So to say that you're against the ordinance is really not the thing to say. The thing to say is I'm against uh, certain portions of it. And there's a lot of good things uh, in this ordinance. Now the idea of bees, uh, 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 the bees have been there forever. When I, came, when I first moved to Arizona, 
uh, people said, uh, you know, I had uh, some uh, allergies, uh, and uh, people said, eat the local honey, and, uh, and that will help you with your allergy problem. You can't get honey much more local than the honey that I was eating. Uh, it was right, right around the street from, from me, right, uh, right down the street, actually. And uh, I would hate to see that go away. Those, uh, 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 I, I know there's a lot of talk about uh, Africanized uh, bees. Uh, uh, I know a couple of years ago, I think they killed a horse up here in some place, Herbert or something. Uh, then, you know, that can be an issue. But, uh, you know, uh, we have a responsible beekeeper that's keeping these bees here. And uh, the idea that, uh, you know, we're not going to get rid of them, but uh, maybe somebody should, uh, you know, just keep an eye on that. Uh, and, this, you know, the city manager, I don't see where that's that big an issue to let the city manager decide, uh, uh, you know, uh, who gets to keep bees. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, you get a responsible person doing it in a responsible manner that knows what they're doing. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry the bee guy wasn't here tonight. You know, that's one of the people that I would, I would like to hear what he has to say about that. Uh, but, um, uh, you know, I, uh, I and, and as far as the livestock goes, you know, uh, people have had, you know, I was actually amazed when I first came here that, you know, actually, uh, more or less, uh, in some backyards here, there's horses, you know, and, uh, and within the city limits. And uh, uh, it's, uh, Really, what it's about is being a good neighbor, uh, and a lot of people aren't good neighbors. There are, there are people that uh, they keep barnyards right next uh, to uh, their next door neighbor, and they stink. They're full of feces. They attract flies. They make noise. They're irritating as hell. And uh, yeah, we have to have some means of controlling that kind of behavior. I mean, uh, they absolutely do. You can't uh, just say, "Oh yeah, well, you can do this. You can do that." There has to be some control over it because people take advantage and skirt the law, and it happens all the time. And there has to be some method of dealing with that sort of thing. And uh, but usually uh, there's complaints from the public. You know, somebody complains and said, "Look, uh, I'm living next to a barn yard. What's the city going to do about it?" Well, we have to have something in the books to do to deal with that. There absolutely has to be something. So. Uh, uh, I, I think it's pretty generous, that, you know, what you have six chickens, that's pretty, you know, this is uh, actually, uh, it's a city. We live in a little tiny city in Old Michigan, for no. sure. No, 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 no. no. Let's no. keep it, I, this Let's is get my turn to talk. <laughs> You've had your turn. Okay. I don't think I have anything else to say. Ms. Hanson. <coughs> I do have done quite a bit of, uh, I don't say quite a bit, done some research on, uh, on feral cats specifically because that was the biggest area that concerned me. And uh, what I would really like to see is the people who are running the shelter be responsible for a program for feeding the cats and for the TNR. Um, and coming up with a plan <coughs> as to how that's going, going to work. Because I think if you have the experts doing it and monitoring it, I really think that, that it can succeed. How much, I don't know, because there are no statistics. There, there's no data on how well it works because when you return the animal to the area, you don't know if there's other animals that are being abandoned, unless you know every animal that's in that area, which I think Dana did, because it was like a, a smaller air, uh, number of cats, or? 45. Okay. That's not a small number. <laughs> I surprised you know them all. <laughs> but anyway, the, to come up with a, a, a plan as to how to, to work that, or to, uh, Feed the cats, have specific people that are feeding them and not just anybody and having the, the, the colonies. Um, I know it successfully worked someplace else. I don't know where Gretchen Bear was, but apparently it worked fairly well there too. And let's face it, we created the problem. Not we busy, but humankind created this problem. And we have to do something about it. We can't, it's not going to go away. 
So I think that our best bet is to try to organize and manage it as much as possible and have the experts do it. Thank you. Ms. Okay. Um, everybody has pretty much covered um, a lot of what I had down in my notes. Um, I do have um, a little bit of an issue with 6.1.2 on N with the owner um, because to me it, it's conflicting because if we're feeding the feral cats are we now their owner according to this we are um, and then with Q on the any animal um, if you're not there, you don't know if you were if somebody was bitten without provocation. Because I know kids come by and um, with our neighbors' dogs, and you know they throw rocks, and their dogs can get out, they can get over the fence. So if they're bit, they they could have been provoked. Um, but I know that everything is a case by case situation. And then the other issue is on five, 6.1.5 um, on the care of the animals. Um, I think most people that have pets take excellent care of them. And I know there's some that, that don't. We see them on the news all the time. But uh, my question is how can any of this be enforced, that whole section? <coughs> And then on the 6.1.7, the interference with the ACO, I believe this was an issue on Brophy. And I don't know if that's what provoked all of this, but, um, and then, you know, the feeding of, of the uh, feral animals. Um, you know, most of us aren't going to starve animals. And, my kids, and I'll, I'll just use my kids as an example, they have always brought strays home. You know, two-legged and four-legged all their lives, and they're continuing to bring these animals home. And we generally find homes for them, or we keep them. Um, they, are, they are very well taken care of. Um, so I don't know, I, I don't agree with um, not feeding an animal, and my husband grew up in the country, and you know he was always feeding you know raccoons, deer, skunks, hyenas, you name it. Um, you have a lifetime of that. It doesn't stop all of a sudden because there's an ordinance. Um, so <coughs> we probably would be guilty of some of this. Um, and then on the six point one point eleven and the 6.1.25, um, to me that's a little conflicting. Um, and I, I, I agree with Bill on this as far as um, <coughs> you know, those that can keep a reasonable amount of chickens or, or whatnot on their property for their own use or for you know, their family's you know, eggs or whatnot. Um, I think that's good, but we know that there are some that violate this um, a lot, and I know that there's somebody in my neighborhood that has, I mean, I hear roosters all the time, I hear ducks, and um, if they're, if they are already being kept up and their living area is, you know, I mean, I don't have an issue with that, but I know that we had a gentleman that came before us and was complaining about the stench. And um, around monsoon time, I, I guess it gets worse. And then the, uh, the last thing I have on this is 6.1.12 on the noisy animals. I think most of us that have dogs know that, um, that part, know that if they are, mine in particular, I guess I shouldn't, you know, bring everybody's into this. Mine in particular, if they're out there howling or barking or causing a fuss, it's because generally when we go out, the javelina are running down the road. 
or there's somebody in the neighborhood that shouldn't be there, or another stray animal. Um, so, I mean, that's what dogs do. They're going to, they're going to howl, they're going to bark, and that's most of the time to alert us to something that's not normal in our neighborhood. So, um, I don't know. That's just what I have for right now. Thank you, ma'am. <coughs> Uh, a couple things. Uh, it, it was brought up that if we can't enforce the dog leash law, then how are we going to enforce these other things? I'm sorry, we're not taking questions. Uh, we had the opportunity to, do, to, to speak previously. Um, and the point is that we don't have a dog leash law. That's how this all got started, <laughs> is because the dog leash law was written out of the statutes uh, when there was a minor change <coughs> made, um, and this whole thing started with writing it back in and then adding some things from citizens' input that came in. People don't understand on occasion that it's, it's very convenient to kill the messenger, but that most of what is, comes forward from the mayor and council is because someone has asked for that to come forward. They typically aren't sitting here and deciding what to do. Uh, many of us don't have, if you'll pardon it, a dog in a hunt. Okay? It just so happens, and we're not advocating positions. Um, what I would uh, <clears throat> propose, because we don't have any member of the council that's uh, voice that they're 100% in favor of this. Uh, we have members of the audience saying uh, that they're not in favor of different sections. I'm going to have to believe that they're not against, as I said, and then Mr. Hagan said, they're not against the animal ordinance, they're against sections of the animal ordinance. So what I propose is um, I'm going to make a motion that uh, this item be tabled until the first meeting in April. I'll second that. And, thank you, sir. <laughs> and that I will... It's a work session. Um, you can't, it's a discussion only. I, I, okay. I will indicate that this is what I will be uh, doing. Um, I will be at the next meeting, which is... Uh, and thank you for that clarification. Um, I will be uh, on the next meeting um, asking to asking the council to um, allow me to appoint an ad hoc committee. So that this ordinance will be looked at by that committee. I'm going to specifically in public ask that um, uh, either Ms. Galligan or Ms. Souden be a member of that committee for direct input. And um, Ms. Giacomino, hopefully you could uh, participate. Can, can I ask a question? Can we uh, like open it up to um, members, possible members of the ward also to volunteer? Yes. Yeah, and, and, uh, yeah. And the if, the if members of the public would please just all you need to do is is go online or stop at the office ask for a volunteer for a um a uh, committee application and and fill that out and then that'll come to me that gives us enough time where if the council allows me to appoint a committee this next meeting then the committee will be appointed the first meeting in um, Mark, uh, February, and that gives them the month of February and March to come back with recommendations that will go back through council to make sure that there's legal, that, that those recommendations are legal, um, and um, then to bring it then for the first meeting in April. So that's my intent. Um, so, yeah, and take your second away. You can't do that. I'll take my second away. 
Council, does that um, seem to fit with what we need? And Ms. Klein, you've got a lot of comments. So I would appreciate it if you in the position as a counselor um, get those to our city clerk so that she can then get it to the right people so that we're not violating the open meeting law by talking to each other about it. But, uh, and I encourage all of you, um, uh, all of you indicated that, you know, that you had some things you didn't like or that you would like to see different. I would encourage all of you to get those to um, our city clerk so that she then can get it to the ad hoc committee. They can then in turn get it to legal. And I want to come forward one more time to get this thing so that it fits what the community wants as a whole. Thank you. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I just got a quick question. If we don't have a current leash law, mm -hmm. then why do we still have signs up at the Vista Park? Around? Well, because we, 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 we well, hold on. It still, there, that's a separate statute. We don't have a leash law, but having, believe this or not, this law is so antiquated that having a dog in the park is illegal. We have a statute that you can't have a dog in a park. We have a dog park, but technically, I guess I don't They can't go there. <laughs> technically, you like, take the feral cats there. I don't know. Um, all right, any other uh, comments from our um, esteemed council? Uh, I hope that the citizens feel that you've, uh, you've been heard and that you're being answered the best that I think you could be answered at this particular point. And that's uh, a do-over. Can I make a motion? Yes. Yes. Do we have a, Mr. Higgins wants to go home. Do we have a second to his motion to the chairman? Second. Thank you. Those in favor of German signify by stating aye. Aye. Opposed, nay. We stand adjourned.